Welcome to Senadivin Education Foundation once again. Education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. We started this education program in 2007 by releasing our brochure by Dr. Antonio Longo from Italy. Then we launched Senadivin Education Foundation in 2012 by releasing a set of educational DVDs by Professor Sion Han Kim from South Korea. We had a six months and one year free fellowship programs with hands-on training in basic and advanced laparoscopic surgery. With the advent of COVID, we changed the platform to online and the logo was launched by Professor Palani Veli from India. We started having live surgeries in online platform the first live surgery in online platform was a laparoscopic anterior resection that was in Facebook Live. Then Whipple's resection in August 2020 in YouTube Live. The link was shared to the members of Sianadipin Education Foundation. Then we started having live lectures with world leaders like Professor Alan Clavian. Recently, we started international fellowship programs in laparoscopic SPB surgery, colorectal surgery, and upper GA surgery in Japan, France, and Korea, respectively. These are the uh, list of uh, candidates selected for the international fellowship program. And uh, Dr. Amir Pere from India and Deetcha Kapoor from India are already in Japan for uh, hepatobanglatobiliary uh, fellowship uh, in Tokyo National University. In the season one, we had 28 webinars with the world leaders. And one of the webinars uh, was by the ERA Society Chairman, Professor Wale Lingus. The ERA Society tweeted in on the Twitter that uh, they gave a wonderful lecture in Sanadhan Education Foundation, one of the largest online meetings with uh, more than 1,400 delegates of our 72 different countries. We have appearance in social media. All the webinar videos are available for free reference in the Sanadhan Education Foundation YouTube channel. Last time we had a webinar with Professor Peter Cotton, who is the inventor of ERCP. And now we are blessed with another legend in the field of surgery, who is a renowned surgeon scientist who introduced Clavian window classification to evaluate surgical complications. He has authored many, many, many books. The important books are Medical Care of the Liver Transplant Patient. Many will be wondering why a, a surgeon writing about medical care of a liver transplant patient. Uh, you have to read that book, actually. And another uh, book, Less of Upper G and SPB Surgery. He is editorial board member of many high-ranked international uh, journals, welcome Dr. Pierre Alain Clavian, Professor, to this uh, education foundation, Sanadipin Education Foundation. And uh, for to moderate, we have another uh, another giant in the field of SPB surgery uh, from India, Dr. Sudhir Shah. Uh, uh, Dr. Sudeep, welcome to Sanadipin Education Foundation to formally introduce uh, uh, Dr. Pierre Alan Clavian and Sudeep Shah. We have Dr. Abdullahi Ibrahim Mohammed from Kenya, who is uh, uh, working under me uh, doing the six months uh, international fellowship under Sanadipin Education Foundation. He is from uh, Kenya. Uh, before giving uh, the mic to uh, Dr. Abdul Abdullahi, I will invite all of you to attend the next webinar, SPB Sonography Demystified, Dr. Amit Padak from India. Before that, I am requesting all the participants to kindly mute their mic. If possible, kindly acknowledge by renaming your device by yours. Participants logging from outside India are requested to reveal their identity in the chat box. Raise your hand if you uh, want to intervene. We entertain one-to-one -one interaction. Everybody will be given permission to unmute their mic if they wanted to interact. If you are on a portable device, please mute your audio and hide your video. And if you have any doubts 
or any queries, please write to senadiban at gmail.com. Thank you. I'll stop the uh, sharing the video here. I request Dr. Abdullahi to share his video, uh, his slides. Okay. Over to Dr. Abdullahi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Baiju Senadipan, for giving me this opportunity to introduce our speakers today. We have two impressive gentlemen, Dr. Sudip Shah, who is our moderator for today, and our speaker, Professor Pierre Alain Clavien. We all know the Clavian window classification. They will take us through the topic on how to measure outcomes of a surgical procedure. One way of ensuring high surgical standards is by reporting operation outcomes. This has been shown to improve public transparency and accountability, and also enable surgeons to better judge and improve their practice. Without further ado, I will introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Sudip Shah. He is a consultant, uh, is a consultant gastrointestinal, HPB, and liver transplant surgeon at PD Hinduja Hospital and Medical Research Center in Mumbai. He did his basic degree and MS in general surgery at GS Medical College. He is a fellow at the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. He did his fellowship in HPB surgery and liver transplant at Queen Elizabeth Hospital and Royal Free Hospitals in the UK. He is the coordinator of GI Cancer Disease Management Group at the National Cancer Grid. He was the chairman of the ethics committee at Tata Memorial Hospital. He is a member of several national and international associations and, and societies. He is a council member of the Asia Pacific Hepatopancreatobiliary Association. He is a member of the education and training committee at IHPBA. He is involved in various research projects, including thrombophilia states in portal vein thrombosis and molecular diagnosis of abdominal tuberculosis and tumor genetics. He is a reviewer in more than a dozen uh, national and international journals. He is an associate editor at the Indian Journal of Surgery. He has indexed more than 45 national and international publications on liver, pancreas, GI surgery, and liver transplantations. He has presented in more than 70 conferences with publication of the abstracts in various international and national journals. He has authored more than seven specialty specific chapters for national and international books, which are listed. I now move to the speaker for today's talk, Professor Pierre Alain Clavien. He is the professor and chairman Department of Surgery and Transplantation at the University Hospital in Zurich, Switzerland. He is also the chairman at the Center of Surgery in Zurich and he is also the director of Swiss Hepatopancreatobiliary and Transplantation Center in Zurich. He did his basic degree at Geneva Medical College in Switzerland. He was certified by the Swiss Board of Surgery in 1990. And in 1992, he did his PhD at the Institute of Medical Science and Immunology at the University of Toronto. His areas of research include organ preservation, liver ischemia reperfusion injury, and liver regeneration, and pathogenesis of cancer, with publications in several international journals. 
His laboratory made the discovery of serotonin as a key mediator of liver regeneration and pathogenesis of, of cancer. Professor Clavian has also developed a simple and widely used system to evaluate complications after surgery, which holds his name, the Clavian Dindo classification, and developed and validated the comprehensive complication index. He is the coordinator He is a member of more than 50 national and international uh, uh, committees and societies, among them the European African HPBA and IHPBA. He is, the board of the, he is a board of director uh, and counsel at the British Journal of Surgery and Society. He is the editor of Patient Safety in Surgery, which is an online journal. Is an associate editor at the Annals of Surgery and Journal of Hepatology. He sits in more than 17 editorial boards. He has more than 25 honors and awards. And he has given more than 250 special lectures internationally. He has published over 550 peer reviewed articles in high-ranked international journals. The impact of his research is highlighted with a H index of 110 and a, and a citation index of 52,100. He is the editor of five books, among them Medical Care of the Liver Transplant Patient, as mentioned by Professor Baiju Senadipan, and also he, he, he is the editor of Atlas of Upper Gastrointestinal and Hepatopancreatobiliary Surgery. These are some of his clinical publications, and I have listed some of his research publications. Thank you so much, professors. Over to you uh, for the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah, for the uh, nice introduction of the moderator uh, as well as the speaker. Now I hand over the mic to the moderator, uh, Dr. Sudisha. Uh, thank you, Professor Beju, for this very kind in invitation. And uh, it's, it's a delightful topic that you've chosen for this meeting. Uh, you are a fabulous technical surgeon and a lot of meetings today concentrate on technicalities of how to do robotic, how to do laparoscopic tips and tricks. But what we all know is what really matters are patient outcomes. And quality is not just about doing a technically perfect operation. There are many, many more facets than this. And who better speaker than Professor Pierre Allen Clavian? His interest in complications started way back in 1992 during his fellowship in Toronto, where he published on the complications of cholecystectomy laparoscopic cholecystectomy was just erupting on the background. And Professor Strasberg, who was his mentor at that time, has been one of the leaders in this field along with Professor Clavier. And these thoughts then crystallized into this leading clavian dindo classification, which has gotten more than 25,000 citations. And there is no paper which mentions complications today, which does not quote this clavian dindo classification. More interestingly, and I suppose we'll hear more about this during his lecture, is the Comprehensive Complication Index, which brings in many more subtleties than just this classification. And we really look forward to this lecture on, on how to assess outcomes in surgery and how the qualities of systems are tested to get a improvement for individual patients, to look for improvement in hospital care, and also, and which is very important in LMIC countries and countries like India, where insurance is coming in through the government to ensure that resources are very well used. So I don't want to take up much more time. I would like to pass over to Professor Clavian. We would love to listen to your lecture and then we can have a, an enlightened discussion in the 45 minutes we have after that. Okay, do, do you hear me? Very clearly. 
Okay. Well, so thank you, uh, Dr. Sudip Shah, for this very nice and kind uh, introduction, and also to uh, Dr. Beishu Senadipan for the organizing this. I mean, um, it's a big honor for me, and I can see there are many participants. That's the modern way of uh, Zoom. I can be in Switzerland and talk to many uh, surgeons in India. Uh, my slide, could you show my slide or how it works? Do you have my slides? Uh, we had it before here. Do you have it? Uh, it's not at come. No, okay. Because we did the, the trial before and we had it. So that's uh, okay. I don't know what to do to have it here because I did have it before. I put the share. Can maybe someone help me on the system? Because we before they told me everything is fine. More seats. In the bar, uh, there is a green button, share screen. Well, I tried before. I have the share now. I have nothing except the full screen. Uh, okay, explore with Zoom. I have even an advertisement for Zoom, nothing else. Uh-oh, because it works before, so I know it can't work. Uh, <sighs> Okay, launch meeting, that's what I have now here. I'm really sorry, but now I'm totally disconnected from you. Maybe you hear me. I just have a picture with a lady taking up something, nothing else. I don't know, what should I do here? I'm sorry, I launched the meeting again. Maybe it come, hello, maybe it come back. Oh, here, now I have you here. So it cut me. I don't know, I need help because I really have no uh, here share screen. I had it before, I can put here. Um... Yeah, it has come, but uh, it's not the PowerPoint. You can take the PowerPoint. Do you have it? Yeah, yeah, now you can see the PowerPoint. Okay. Now you can go into slideshow. I'm sorry about that. Is that okay now? Yeah, it's okay now. Okay. So again, thank you very much for the uh, nice introduction and to inviting me. And I'm delighted uh, to be able from my home to deliver this uh, this uh, talk. We have, I think, about 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And then if I understand properly, we have a discussion. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So what I will do today and in the uh, agenda, oops, sorry, I tried to go here is we speak in fact about quality in surgery. We have to speak a little bit globally on the healthcare system, which is the same in, in any country, at least the way we analyze that. And at the end, we'll talk a bit of outcome, which is the main topic of uh, today. Well, we speak about quality, not everybody uh, see the same, understand the same thing about quality. Uh, the standard that we have is to say that standard of something when it is compared to another thing like it. So we have something to compare and how good it is when we compare to something else. I think everybody may understand that. Now we can see this is very subjective. If I take my city here in uh, Zurich and I take this city here, New Delhi, and then you have to define which one is the most beautiful city. And I may imagine that we may have very different opinion and uh, so quality is always a little bit subjective. We learned from the, the past that the first principle of doctors is not to arm, if possible to help, but certainly not to arm. And that was well here in the Hippocrates that we are still today quoting all the time. Well, whatever we do, surgery, we always inflict a little bit arm in patients. So. The only way probably not to arm would be to stop doing surgery, which is of course not an option. So we need to look at that with a little bit good judgment. It's pretty clear when a patient has pain and you do these pictures and find a Kelly clamp, it's a problem. Uh, we have that in the news. You can read here in the Washington Post, for example, that 5,000 objects were left in patients. So the people that read that don't think we are very safe. Uh, that is always article all the time about mistake by a surgeon. They operate on the wrong patients. 
And this is a very important cause of death in the US. So the population is aware that while we can help them, we can also hurt. And if we look a bit about statistic, either from safety or the economy, we can see that even nuclear power is much less than the US healthcare. This US data, but I may imagine we can many countries. So there is absolutely clear that on the scale of risk, we are very high in this system. And even here, if we look at the, 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 the cause of deaths, we the third most common cause of death in the US, at least the way the statistic was done. So how to quality, we can see quality from different perspectives. Uh, the most important is probably the patient. And I like to start by showing this, this example that I would just show to you now that we understand that always interpretation from a patient perspective is highly uh, subjective. So here the, the quote from von Goethe is not the doctors, but no two people see the world exactly alike. Even one and the same person won't always maintain the same view and judgment. This is pretty common sense that evaluation is different. I take an example here that's a study that we can, you can see that we did many years ago while I was in the, in the United States when we were looking at quality of life after liver transplant, two patients. They are typical patients. We have a young man who has primary sclerosing cholangitis, not very sick, in fact, and uh, he will underwent transplant. We compare to this patient, el old elderly patient, 68, hepatitis C, carcinoma, his intensive care unit with a high meld, and he has a lot of comorbidities. And both of them have liver transplant, and after that, we want to see what's the, 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 the quality of life from these patients. The first patient has to be expected as no complication. Basically did very well, is young. The other one spent three weeks in the ICU, long term in the hospital, was on dialysis. He developed very, very many complications. And uh, what's going on? In fact, very interestingly, this patient who has only this scar was done many years ago, is very unhappy. The young patients had to take medication and is unhappy, has many problems following transplant. This one, uh, the 68, on the other hand, as a big scar, was very sick, is delighted about what's going on because the baseline was not the same. So very subjective in evaluation from the patient perspective. And how we define from the surgeon perspective, from our perspective, anything that goes aside of the best course is a problem. And we can grade this in different ways of complication. So it's more objective, not more important, but more objective from the, the, the doctor perspective and arm has to do with quality. Now, if we look at what we have done in the literature as a surgeon when we published, and then we are not very proud. If we look at that, what information do we have in the literature? And very interestingly, if we look here, the follow-up information, so in papers, we have it, here, uh, sorry, in 22%. So 80% of the papers that was done in the 2002 do not tell how long we follow the patient. A definition of a complication, only a third of the paper will quote on the definition. How serious is it? Only 20%. And if we want to know about complication, we need risk factors, only 30%. So when other people read our literature, they are not very impressed because we are not reporting well. We just read the study like that recently on the top surgical journal, and have to admit that the uh, to, to that about half of the paper do not give give enough information to evaluate really uh, the outcome. That's the reason we did uh, very, a short time ago in June last June a consensus conference in Zurich about exactly this topic uh, to look at how. A methodology which is convincing and that was the different panels that we had we had nine panels lasted three days we started with patient perspective healthcare payer you can say government legal we talk about benchmarking and we have also about cultural and demographic interpretation that's also rarely uh, known in papers what population we really uh, study the way we need to look at a complication or evaluation of quality, we have these three 
steps that I think is important to know when we talk to epidemiologists and others. So this terminology should be known by us. We start with the structure. The structure, I will give an example here, is the characteristic of the provider's facilities, independent of us. Then we have the process, which is the conduct of healthcare, and then the outcome, then we all understand what outcome, although could be different, is. So if we look first at the structure of the healthcare system, that's an example. If you have a hospital doing different volume, we know volume matter, and that's part of the structure of the institution we are. And you can see here, for example, here, major HPV surgery, very high volume to low volume. And we can see here that there is a difference in mortality in outcome. In fact, there is a 41% reduction in in-hospital mortality in high volume center. So that's the structure that tell you because of volume, which means more specialists, more people, et cetera, just that is associated with a better uh, outcome. An example in pancreas resection, I think this is pretty well known. This data is already a bit old, but it mattered today. And you can see here that the that's per, per center or per surgeon, that it decreased significantly for 4% to less than 1%, depending of the experience of the hospital or the surgeon in performing a complex procedures. Here also is not just the doctors. That was done, the number for nurse for patient, the ratio of nurse, we have enough nurses. And here we also have a correlation, which is quite significant and show that that matter in the outcome. If you combine this with center volume or surgeon volume, then the difference become even higher. That's a study that we did a few years ago. So here looking at that and summarize the volume of the hospital play a role on short-term outcome. That makes sense. If the hospital, that means is also anesthesiologist, ICU, et cetera. So you will have complication relative early on. On the other hand, the surgeon, surgeon may play a role if he's able to do a R1 versus R0 section or other problem. And that has more an impact on long-term outcome. This is a graph that summarizes a bit this issue of volume versus uh, re result. And that's an example here. You have here the outcome, whatever we measure here, mortality or complication. And here you have the volume of patients. And to a low volume, the results are not good. Then we have here a learning curve, for example, 20 cases to 60 cases, then the outcome is better. And then we have a plateau, and very interestingly, what we are now funding, and that's a very clear observation, that at a certain point, it could be 200, 300 or less, you have a breakdown, results go down. The explanation for that is usually high volume is associated with longer waiting time or other aspects that are negative. So there is, doesn't mean more you do, better you are. It means there is a plateau when you need to reach, but above that, if the structure are not correct, the result may not be optimal. So when, let's go an example to the process before we go to the uh, outcome. So that's the conduct of healthcare delivery. That's an example, that's a paper that we published in the uh, Annals of Surgery presented at the European Surgical uh, uh, Association a couple of years ago. And the study was relatively simple. We presented to expert surgeon cases. As an example here, a 60 year old patient with synchronous metastasis, right side and colon cancer, and many metastases. And then we wanted to know, sorry, why it doesn't, yeah. So that's the participant. You can see 38 participants from 20 countries. So that was really a, a large and India was involved in this uh, study. And then we asked question, how do you treat these patients? And we wanted to look if there is consistency. Is us as experts, we all offer the same or we have very different values. And, we, and so we can see here that that's the result. And that's the, the, the value here of the, uh, the kappa. And you can see that there is a strong correlation or not between that. And I will not go in many detail, but there was basically very poor correlation or agreement, that's a better term, among the surgeon. And that suggests if I am a patient, I'm not really secure because I know that from an expert to another, contrary to another, my treatment would be completely different, although we are speaking about expert in the field. Uh, oh. So that's a number of the paper, which was a bit provocative, not just the throw of the dice. I think we are doing better than that. 
but I wanted to see to take to go with a message. So I just wanted to give these two as example what we mean by process and what we may mean by structure. And now I go to an outcome, which is the result of our experience. So outcome, there are many things we may look at: mortality, complication, etc. You can include cost and other value here. And what's the best of the result? Now I show you two an example of two patients who had whatever uh, surgery uh, we can imagine, complex surgery. The, com the patient A is a grade one, three A, three so three complication, and the other one is different type of complication. And now we're supposed to say, well, which one is the best outcome from those? Uh, this and it is not clear what it is from uh, from this uh, comparison. So that's when we developed Dr. Slankamenak Slanka while with me did a PhD, and she was asked to de to define an index or something on mor morbidity as we do for mortality. It's easy to understand one, three, five percent mortality. Could we have the same on morbidity? So she developed a, a complication index that take into account all complication by severity. So using uh, the, our classification to go for that. So based on the Clavian Dindo grading system, and that includes, she did, I will not go in detail for Tom Rim, but she did uh, a lot of, of uh, questionnaire going to patient and physician. So we will have both perspective on the value of this. And there is nothing in medicine, but in business, they know this kind of things. If they have to evaluate the risk of putting money somewhere based on political issue, on the market, et cetera. They have such system that enable to give an index of risk. So that's where we went and learned from that. And I will not go. So basically the index that was done is zero. You have no complication, easy to understand. And under it, you are dead. And in between are morbidity. To go back to our two patients that we showed before. So we enter in this formula. Uh, the calculated here, and we can see here that, for example, here the first patient A has a CCI complication index of 47 and the other one 38. So here we have a new tool validated that enable to tell which patient in fact has a poor uh, outcome. And this was also pretty nice because we can follow over time. You can have a CCI at uh, discharge, at three months, six months, etc. So we can have a follow up as we wish, as we design about the morbidity on any patient, usually it's done up to one year. And you will see it has been used in benchmark. And at the end, we can say how long we need to follow patients. For example, if pancreas surgery complication occur within six months and then they are the same, then we can conclude that six months is what we need to follow up this patient to be conclusive. And pancreas is six months, but we saw for liver transplant, we must follow them one year because many complications still occur between six months and one year, for example, by the strictures. Now I go to another concept, which is today a hot topic. I think there's still many things to discuss how we want to do that, which is benchmarking. I took here our Swiss mountain. You have the same in, in India too, but you have a course like this one, pretty nice. Another one, a little bit more rough. And you have another one that can be really difficult. How do we measure this gap? How we can conclusively compare these two courses, knowing that it may also be related uh, to uh, uh, the, the, the patient population we are looking at. And this is now the concept of benchmarking. I just want to show that because this was done a bit arbitrary uh, by consensus, uh, how we do that. And this is the, the value, this benchmark value is never one center. This is a group of centers. And then we need to define what is the best achievable value. There is a lot of subjective terms in that. So let's say here as an example that we have these five institution and that's the CCI they have, let's say at six months, that's the difference. How do we define now what's the value? So the way it was done, you have a median value, you have the extreme value and you have a 75 percentile and we decided that 75 percentile will be the benchmark value selecting both the best cases and the best institution. So the message, if you are the 75 percent of the best institutions and the good case, the low risk cases, then you are within the benchmark value. Uh, here, uh, and I show you examples, several papers have been done 
Here, this is on liver transplants. That was one of the studies was done a couple of years ago. And the first thing you see many authors because many centers are involved, usually on three continents. And we have, in fact, for this study, 17 centers. We study five years, relatively recent five years, must be on three continents. We were looking at the largest program per country, at least 50 transplants per year. And we defined a low risk population to study and to uh, identify the benchmark value. Uh, here, so the, 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 the selection of the case for transplant, this is not only the recipient, but also the donor. I will not go into many detail, but that was only brain death, wool organs, so no living donors here. And of the recipient, we took the easy, not the easy, but the good case. You can see relatively low melt for those uh, uh, familiar with liver transplant, no retransplant, and no other big problem. And we have also a score that uh, balance both called the balance risk. And here we took also something that is relatively low. So in summary, we took only the good cases. And for 7,500 cases that was collected, in fact, 2,000, about a third, were benchmark cases. And that's the population analyzed. Now I show you a summary of the result. That's, for example, the CCI at the discharge, 29. And then we can see that it increased over one year. And that's just what I mentioned before. You need to follow this patient at least one month, one year, because there is still an increase here uh, in morbidity for this uh, patient while it's fat, flat thereafter. That's the benchmark value, just as a summary. A, so the duration of surgery less than six hours, six hours, number of uh, unit of blood less than three, ICU less than four, hospital less than 80. That's the data collected in three continents. So if you have a patient who is not in this benchmark, then you have to think why they are not in this benchmark. That's a summary here at the discharge up to 12 months and different complications that we were looking at. They basically all have at least one complication. That's biliary complication, about 30% as a benchmark. If you're below that, then you are within the benchmark, CCI 42. And what we already know, but we can have a metric, we have a very low mortality today, you know, low, relatively low, less than 10%, but a high morbidity. Uh, and that increase over the first year. That's the main message we could have. Now we have another observation that I would like briefly to, uh, to show because it was found in every uh, uh, study we did, pancreas, et cetera. And this graph, you have the total number of liver transplant per center, you have the 17 center, and we differentiate the total versus the benchmark cases. So the ratio of easy versus complicated case. Two examples, they have about the same volume, but one has 8% of benchmark, so they operate mostly on difficult cases, while the other one are more than 50% or 50% uh, easy cases. And what we observe here, and we saw that for pancreas, is that the center with a low uh, benchmark case operating on difficult case is better outcome. And that's very important for the US when they avoid operating on high risk case because of low suit, et cetera. In fact, this is the opposite. More difficult case you do, better you are, not just the surgeon, but the team. We found exactly the same thing on Whipple and pancreas, that if you operate on difficult cases, then your rate of fistula is much lower in benchmark in the same cases. And that's an observation that we found, in fact, on almost every benchmark study that uh, were uh, done. Here, I also as an example, don't be worried about all this data. We did, as would be published, in fact, was presented this year on the retransplant. Transplant. So now we don't take the easy case of transplant, but the retransplant. And we also here uh, look at the benchmark cases, so not the complicated uh, retransplant, but the one who are relatively low risk. And what we found here, uh, what we found here, oops, is that the CCI, if you remember, it was 42 for the normal is 72. So we can highlight the major risk associated with retransplant versus primary transplant. Graph loss was 10% is double in retransplant and mortality is also much higher. So that's just something we can look at between one procedure and another one looking at benchmark cases. Uh, I don't know how to do this because I have something on my screen. Oh, here's better, sorry. 
So we did another one, and we've done several, and that's the people who did that. That's uh, uh, Eva Breuer here and uh, Matteo Muller who did the study. So you have residents, very smart who did the study. And you can see here again, a lot of people. And we are very interested in perialer cholangiocarcinoma and look at resection. And we did another one on transplant for the same uh, disease, so the same study. Uh, and that's the other one that we did for transplant. So perialer transplant versus perialer resection. How can we compare that? And the benchmark enable here to have some unique a result, I will not go in many detail, but interestingly here, of course, you need to correct for selection, which was done, benchmark cases. And we came here to the conclusion that in fact, transplant is better, which is not what is accepted in European country. And if you are qualified for transplant, then your chance of mortality is half if you go to transplant versus if you have a resection. And this even include the group for Nagoya, who are absolutely with results that nobody can reproduce. They are very good. Even taking into account this, while the complication rate is the same, uh, the mortality is different. And our conclusion from just this study is that if you have patients who qualify for transplant with a perialer cholangiocarcinoma, you must inform the patient that if they have a transplant, they will have a better outcome. That's another graph here. We'll not go too much uh, in detail, but we have many, it's only a summary. We have done the ALPS procedure. So the big two-stage hepatectomy, Whipple, we don't leave a transplant. We just know robotic uh, distal pancreatectomy, leaving, et cetera. And now we can compare this procedure. It was impossible before. And we can see if we look, for example, at mortality, well, the highest mortality, but it's pretty low here. We don't have, uh, is, the, 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 is the, uh, the ALPS procedure compared to the other one. Etc. So we can now, for the first time, really compare uh, the different procedure in terms of different endpoint and different metric. Uh, whoops. So uh, from this talk, what we have here is that we have the structure. I think I encourage every one of you to understand what structure means, because you talk to your hospital leadership, and it's very important when you use their terminology. Uh, and what it is, the process that I can show as an example here, which is on us since one, the, the agreement of doing procedures, for example, and at the end, the outcome, what we want to know, what we want to measure, and whether we want the benchmark, we want to want textbook, there's different way, and this is not totally, this consensus conference gives some opinion from the jury, but this is an area that still need to be uh, developed. And also very, very important, I think it's nothing new here, but it's not done very wisely in any country that I'm aware of, with a few exceptions, maybe in Japan is a bit better, but is to monitor our result, to have a database, all this benchmark study were done on, on database available, prospective database, and it need to be done by independent people. That was one of the main message of this consensus conference, why we do poorly, because when our resident or, 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 or us record complication, for whatever reason, we like to omit some data and at the end it's not very reliable. So you need here uh, to have independent study nurse or global data manager who collect this data in a prospective way and in a timing. So I'm here at the, the, the end of the talk. I'm happy to have discussion. I think this might be the better best part. So it's very important. I could not today present all this, but I hope you will be interested by this consensus conference we need to look at all perspective. And one perspective may not be the same as the other one. Us as a surgeon is a different perspective than the patients. And there is, to my knowledge, no metric that combine both. I don't think we will one day one, but we don't know. Today we don't have, and we are driven more and more by the economy, finance, and how we integrate outcome in terms of finance. This is an open topic in every country, whatever the wealth of the country is. And then the component of health care, we are convinced about this benchmark methodology. There may be another one for sure. There is other one, but it's very important to know where we are. And for example, when we do the benchmark of resection for peri I did not expect that the mortality is 13%. We speak about the ideal case of peri cholangiocarcinoma. We also found that doing, which is not what we teach, that doing a left hepatectomy is better than a right. I always learn you do a right, you can go wide on the bile duct, you have more R0 resection, and in fact, the mortality is twice 
when you do a left versus a right. So we are learning here by benchmark study, some padding that may not be uh, true. Uh, and it enable to compare any country with other, and we use it now on individual patients. So every patient is presented at our morbidity uh, mortality. And if the value is not within the benchmark, it needs to be discussed. So it can be a patient with higher risk and everything is okay, but it has to be discussed that we understand why. If you are within the benchmark value, that's not much to discuss because you are among the best in your outcome. But we analyze often the high risk cases with benchmark. That's something to learn why this patient did so well. We're expecting problems, but is among the best. So we can also learn from the good result and not from the uh, bad uh, result. Okay, I think I'm done with the talk now. I need at the end to acknowledge that was a long journey in the meaningless middle Puan, and that's for me or for us, the reason we could move in this area is the head of epidemiology spent many years at John Hopkins. So he is not a, a, um, a surgeon or clinician if you want, but we have been able to have a fantastic synergy, for example, in the CCI, take a lot of time, a PhD to do that, and we had to work together because initially the scale was extremely high, difficult, uh, and then I told him we need to adjust that for zero to 100, and he did that, so mathematic work on this, and at the end we use it because it's easy for us as clinicians to understand that zero is perfect, 100 you're dead, and then you can compare in between. And uh, we have here all the different fellow who have done uh, the work, uh, Daniel Dindo, now his private practice, he was a young resident when we developed this classification with one before we worked uh, together on this and came with this. Ksenia did the CCI and many others have done a different uh, benchmark study. For example, Patricia Sanchez, she's from Barcelona. She's now back in Barcelona, was a fellow and did, I think, a very valuable study on, on Whipple and pancreas uh, surgery. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm very happy to uh, have any discussion if, if you wish. Thank you. Brilliant talk, uh, Professor Alan Clavian, as uh, expected, uh, uh, it's with the clear ideas, crisp and uh, clear uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, over to Dr. Sudeep Shah uh, for the discussion. Yes, sir. <clears throat> thank you very much, Professor Clavian, for that. Uh, uh, if I may say, it's a broad introduction rather than a detailed exposition because we could probably have a three-day symposium covering everything that you actually uh, uh, discussed. So uh, maybe I could ask some very specific questions which has come to my mind when I've been trying to apply a lot of your work in my practice. So the first question is that if you look at the Clavian window classification as well as the comprehensive complication index, we don't take into account the pre-morbid patient condition. For example, if I do Whipple's mainly on 70, 75 year old diabetic patients, I'm more likely to get a grade four complication of a stroke postoperatively than if I'm doing periampillary cancer Whipple's resections on 45 year old patients. So why have you left out the pre-morbid conditions when dealing with these uh, classifications and this index? Well, thank you. I think it's an excellent question. I had this question several times. So the goal was to develop a tool, a metric, not to compensate for everything. And then it ended up to be very complicated that change over time, the risk, and then it's not valid. So the idea was just to have a metric. And then right. of course, in your paper, you use this tool and then you need to comment to adjust, etc. The CCI is exactly the same. That's a tool. Uh, that is the benchmark is something else. So the benchmark, then we adjust. And the idea of the benchmark was exactly to eliminate all this multivariate analysis. Why? Because we had the impression it's manipulated, the statistic. We don't know exactly what that means. Uh, also, many of these comparisons uh, that are done uh, uh, by different methodology have bias that are not apparent. So that's the idea to have a tool that you cannot change. If, uh, and then the benchmark take into account only the low risk. And unless you are, you are tricking, uh, you have data that you can really compare without any statistical uh, uh, manipulation. You know, so that's a bit the, the idea. 
Yes. So uh, as you as you emphasized again and again in your publications, it is the simplicity of the Clavian Dindo classification that makes it so brilliant and so usable across the world. Now, this benchmarking is a relatively new concept, and this is your recent work. So we have the possum, the nisquip, as again to uh, emphasize on the preoperative condition of the patient. When you benchmark, what factors do you actually take in as far as the pre-morbid patient conditions go? Or does it vary from case to case? For example, you showed us a very simplistic version of what is an ideal liver transplant, but you didn't take in age and comorbidity. You just took in a metal score, no portal vein thrombosis, but you didn't mention whether a recipient was 65 years old or whether the recipient had diabetes, blood pressure, and um, uh, you know, a coronary bypass surgery. Well, I think it's also a brilliant question. It's absolutely correct. You are right. And there's a little bit in the same philosophy. And this is yes. not this one to convince the world to do all the same, but to, to basically have a conversation and go in this direction. And now there's a big discussion about textbook outcome, for example, versus this one. Well, um, this is not done. And that we insist when you study one procedure, whether it's pancreas liver transplant, by one team or one person. It is really based, if possible, on data and possible on consensus. So the age, for example, could be indeed important, but doesn't play really a major role on the outcome of transplant. If they are low risk, many data will show that the age alone is not a risk factor or very low risk factor. We can debate on this. And we try to be also relatively simple. So it's clear if you take liver transplant, you have a portal vein thrombosis, high risk. Retransplant, high risk. The comorbidities in terms of heart disease, lung disease are defined according to specific criteria published in the literature. So we try really to, and then we take the male, this one in addition to that. And we did study, in fact, on the male 25 and 30 to see how it compared to the uh, uh, to the benchmark, and if they are all the same, then maybe next time we need to take a male a little bit higher. But for example, in Switzerland, male like the 20, it's very rare. Our patient is very sick, sicker than that. In other countries like the US, they have a little bit more, uh, less sick patients. So this is some arbitrary, what is low risk? And there is another factor here that you can probably see your next question because you ask a very smart question. What about the surgeon? That's very difficult. Yeah. And everybody, I know you will ask this question, so I do it before you do it. And that, of course, is difficult. And of course, it's difficult. And everybody knows who is doing complex procedure, whether it's Whipple, transplant, the surgeon, and how you, there's a big difference, right? I mean, surgeons do a lot of experience, be talented. And that's not only in be doing the surgery, it's also in the indication, detecting things, et cetera, et cetera, play, play a role into this. Uh, but we could not include the surgeon. That would be totally subjective. And it doesn't mean he has five-year experience who has done a fellowship, we can do it. But that's certainly something that should somewhat be included in some discussion when it come, in come into question. And the benchmark can answer this question. We could take uh, the, the benchmark cases in a young surgeon or younger and versus the senior surgeon and see the difference. So this is again a tool that may enable to address the, the issue. But I agree with you, it's not the perfect system uh, for comparison, for sure not. Uh, one more worry about benchmarking is, does it discriminate you know, smaller centers or the not so confident surgeon from actually taking up difficult cases? And here I could give the example when Professor Azule presented their very large series of 2000 colorectal metastasis resection. He pointed out that in the second thousand, the mortality was double that of the first thousand. Because you start off as a surgeon, very careful, good selection, younger patient. And as you become an international referral center, you are the best of the best. You become more aggressive, more bold. And you'd say that I'd rather cure another 500 patients and accept a 2% higher mortality. But if it is benchmarked and if it is put up internationally, if it is audited, does it A, mean that you will be much safer in what you select and therefore indirectly actually harm the patient? And B, will it mean that less work will be given to a trainee and actually you will encourage the consultant surgeons and professors who are more experienced will do more of the work and training in the long term will suffer so your benchmark after 20 years will be a lot worse? 
what would be your comment on that? Well, I mean, number one, I first congratulate you because they are really bright questions. And in fact, this is one of the reasons we work on this benchmark study, exactly that one. And partly for the US because they have problems in operating on, on high risk patients, as you may know. Yes. They have low suit, et cetera. And as a surgeon, I'm, maybe I don't do the ALPS. Why I will go to do ALPS on a patient that anyway, nobody wants to operate. I know that I may save these patients, but at a high risk, nobody will, I will have a lawyer on my door, et cetera. So that's one of the incentives to look at that. So the example that you showed before, doing a lot of, if that's scale, I mean, it's in Zurich, many places. The, so we always complain, or the young people, we never get the easy case. They don't come to us, right? The other one do it. But when there's problems, they come to us. And at the end of the day, if they just look at mortality from liver resection, they may find that we are higher than the private institution next door, right? And if you do the benchmark study, then you will know the truth. Because if you do a benchmark study, then you will take our benchmark cases, and maybe you find only 10% or 15%, and you take the benchmark cases of the other institution, which could be 90%, and you compare. And almost for sure, you will find better results in the center who has experience. And that's exactly what I show. And that we did not expect that, but this is an absolutely strong correlation between the percent of benchmark. So more benchmark, you do more complication you have because you do easy cases, you can explain. And that was true for redo transplant, liver transplant, esophageal surgery, pancreas was dramatic in terms of the biliary fistulas to show that if you have a high volume difficult cases, your fistula rate is lower, including in benchmark patients. So that's a bright question. And I think we are responsible of force our authority to look at the real data and multivariate analysis are misleading. I hate this multivariate analysis, yeah. taking into account, I don't know what. Pop on CT score, I don't like it to tell you the truth. I don't reject all paper with pop on CT score because sometimes it's the best. But there are a lot of bias that can be done. When you do benchmark, that's just what you say first. You could criticize the selection, right? You could say for liver transplant, well, I mean, I operate my patient, they are all 75 and the other one. Is that, okay, but you have an explanation. You've done your study and at the end you look, if you have the same result, you have nothing to say or just say, I have more difficult patient, I'm still the best. Or if you have a difference, then it forces you to analyze, is that the problem? of the institution, is that the qualification of the surge, is that the population? So you can analyze that in a very uh, objective way. Right, so uh, again, carrying on with the issue of the benchmark, uh, a lot of your audience are from the low and middle income countries and there are parts of India where healthcare may not be as developed as it is all over the Western world. Um, do you feel that because the structure and the process is not as brilliant because the amount that the government spends on health in these countries is much less, the benchmarking process should be different in these countries or do we need to use these benchmarks to arm twist the government into in, to increase our structure and process so that they're equivalent to Western countries so that we may have the same outcomes? So as a broad uh, health philosophy, what is your view on this? Well, it's another very important question. Very, very important because most surgeries are not done at Mayo Clinic, but they are not in other country around the world. And that's absolutely uh, clear from this. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm happy to have your opinion. Or I'm not sure. The idea behind that, and we are aware of that, was from any center, from any place in the world with less resources or less volume to compare and then maybe use this data to be better or to get more resources. If I'm in a place in a country with a low income and I do Whipple and I compare, let's see, I'm within the benchmark value. Well, that's good news to know, right? Even if you have less resources, you're doing well. And I know that many places, that's the case. And they don't need to, uh, the, if they have very poor results in benchmark cases, then they have an objective, it's not always easy to accept, an objective way to look at the problem and say well, something is wrong. So either they correct themselves or the center or they go to the government or whatever. No, it's not easy and say, look at this. In my country here, and we have a large center, we do, we cannot achieve this result. This is benchmark. That means that the world experience where we can see, you need to help me, you need to help us. We need this, we need that. So that's again for me, rather than to have a 
policy and uh, uh, finished data, then it, it, uh, you have more questions at the end. You have more questions and you have good news if you are within the benchmark. Then I think you can uh, show to your country, whatever, that despite whatever, you have very good outcome. So that's really a tool to in, in somewhat in an objective way without complicated statistic that nobody understand if, if some conclusive data. That's the way we were looking at that in fact from the beginning and it was one of the, the advantage we found of this relatively simple methodology. Methodology is not complicated. Many things we are doing, as you said at the beginning, are very simple. There's not much uh, uh, thing. We always try to be on the, on the simple that, that we all understand, that not also in the centers, and as you mentioned, the classification, I was surprised that it was successful, but, but it's very simple. You just, whatever you use to correct the complication, and then it's even a nurse, even whoever can, can collect the data and you can understand. So that we took away the length of stay. There are many things that are subjective. And I think that's why people thought, well, that's easy to understand and that we can reproduce it, even if it's not perfect, because it's not perfect. Uh, which brings me to the next question. And this might be a sensitive question. Um, Every center is proud of their outcomes. And as you very rightly pointed out, even in your talk, that there is a tendency to under-report complications. In your personal experience, did you find that when you started the system, because uh, all your publications state, the University of Zurich, every case you record, all these complications, you have regular audits of the process. When you went to actually validate this, what percent did you find were underreported? And what are the steps that you would give to this audience to ensure that you have the best possible data to analyze and get an accurate result for, for these complications and the benchmarking? Well, I think that's the key factor. You are just touching here the key factors. Now, when you say Zurich, we perfect, et cetera, you miss, and maybe you did on purpose to be nice, you miss one of the paper we published uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago, where we show in a center where I thought we have interest in outcome, we report on AML that more than half of the complications are not recorded. More than half in Zurich, okay? And we published that. I say, okay, maybe other, we published it. We're a little bit worried to say that. And then we did a teaching of the resident that was the same. And then it came to the conclusion that you cannot trust surgeon, resident, they have other duty, I don't think they do on purpose or they want to hide. I think this is not their main focus, it's not. And the conclusion, and that's one of the main points of the consensus conference that is coming up or the, or the publication, you must have independent people. And it's particularly true in some country, I would not quote in for political, where it's very difficult not to be good. You cannot, right? And that's valuable. So the people are not mad, but they would never record a grade one probably half of grade two, it's, uh, does this, this data is difficult to, to believe. And this is not a country with low income. We speak about other countries, probably you know which country I, I, I mean, I will not say that. So you absolutely need, and that's the duty of the hospital, so the, the, the leadership in the structure that you put the money on independent people collecting the data. And the data is presented to us. And that's also where the, the classification is relatively simple because it's easy to collect. If you give antibiotic, you give antibiotic. You don't have to argue what you did it. It's a, it's a grade two complication, et cetera. You go back to surgery, what? you go back to surgery. So you can say it's not perfect, but the data is nothing to discuss. It's not do you have pain a lot, one of 10, or, or you were in the hospital uh, five days more, but in Switzerland, you have no rehabilitation, so many factors. So the, I think the, the, the metric we have, that's what we want. I think it's pretty reliable. Now the question is the who collect this and collect it in a very accurate way. And that's one of the main conclusions of the jury. For every one of us, uh, we need independent people recording. Now you can ask me, in Zurich, I don't, still don't have it. We have a system that we do it. We try to have that also done by the IT, by the computer system, because they can do it. They know what was done. But this is one of the major issues. And as long as we don't have or we don't trust this data, then it's also very difficult to compare. That's correct. Uh, we just move a little bit away from benchmarking. And there's something which you uh, didn't spend much time on, which is the comprehensive complication index. And that I think is very, very fascinating work which comes from your center. It is far less well-known than the Clavian Dindo classification. 
probably it's a little more complex. And uh, this is the time when assesssurgery.com, the website which allows you to automatically calculate this, is very useful for people who are trying to apply this. Um, would you like to tell us this very interesting fact which you had mentioned, that you can translate the cost of health metrics across different health systems by using the same comprehensive complication index and how well you have validated it. And do you think that this cost translation will also apply to LMIC countries? Well, uh, well, I stopped congratulating you because uh, maybe it looked like, but this is also very, very, very important questions. Number one, since the uh, this consensus conference with the jury, so independent, put the CCI very high in the need, we decided to invest and we will redo uh, uh, an app that we can calculate easily uh, this uh, CCI, right? So you just enter the data, the complication, et cetera. So that we work, uh, we will work on that. Now, cost, why we were interested in cost. And in fact, initially we said, well, it's pretty clear. The, the, the classification is based on resources. So there is certainly a correlation with cost. So uh, that's what first, the second point is that we come in, in, in these countries, speak for my country, but we not only add that we start not to trust our administration. So they are calculating costs that escape to us. If I was very mad, I think they are lying to us. I don't, I hope I'm not a lawyer. They give figures that put us in wrong position. So we are as doctors, at least in Western countries, going down, down and down, and they, we're totally misled with cost. And then the idea is that we need a tool that belongs to us, surgeon. And then we started, we have not developed that first. We are working on that, but this is not something we have developed. So we took a few procedures, adjust comorbidity with age. That was done also by Milo Puan. So we try to have something simple, but it cannot be so simple because factor affect the outcome, not just the complication. Yet complication is the most important factors. And then we did some study with relatively simple formula that correlate basically the complication, the CCI with cost. And then we have a tool, uh, that's what the idea, to talk to our administration. And when they come and give us talk, we say, sorry, but we have another way to look at it. And it's completely different than what you are telling us. So to, because we don't, even those with an MBA or whatever, which is fashion in many, I don't think it helped us much. I think it has helped more the administration than patient and surgeon, but that's a personal view. Uh, so that was the idea. I think I would love that other centers or the group try also to use this. And particularly, as you mentioned, other countries than Switzerland and others, because it can even be more significant in country with maybe yes. a little bit less sophisticated technology to correct everything. And I think it would be very useful to, 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 to do that. And we found that the difference in cost, for example, vary, varies by a factor seven, depending on the complication. So this is not insignificant. So seven times the baseline. So if we don't remember, I think for pancreas, we calculated in Switzerland a cost, base cost of, I'm not sure, but about $40,000. Uh, uh, so Swiss franc is the same. If you go to a complicated course or whatever, you were seven times higher uh, and you can adjust that. So this information could be useful. I think this need to be de developed further. We love to see data from, from other countries for sure, because the formula we had try to be international because uh, nobody's interested in a system like Switzerland or others. So we had several countries. Uh, and I think that would be a nice effort that we could do to uh, correlate our, our metric, which is complications and comorbidities that, that the formula is in versus what the administration want us to believe. So uh, could I take this opportunity since we are face to face of saying that, would you like to co collaborate with LMIC countries because we have a particular and a different problem. For example, my ICU bed charge, my hospital stay charge is, is not as expensive as say, injection meropenem, which the patient may have to uh, buy from the market because it's not available in a government hospital. So uh, could we set up some sort of collaboration, do you think in future to try and uh, see whether this is validated in our country? Or do you think that this is something it, which is premature for this, for this scale? Now, face to face, I can tell you, yes, we'll be, we'll be delighted. We try really. And the, the, the very important uh, senior author is that is Milo Puan that I show. You know, I mean, I'm a surgeon. Uh, I like what I'm doing uh, in terms of all this classification, all that. But you need the extra knowledge 
of an epidemiologist or an economist into this to really at the end. Yeah. And I think it would be a fascinating study to compare uh, Switzerland or US with other countries and try to see. I would speculate that the data is the same. Maybe the magnitude of the figure is not the same. So that's, I mean, maybe a Whipple could be 70,000 in the US and 20 in India, I don't know, uh, maybe. Yeah. But at the end of the day, my speculation that because that's marker or independent of many other things will not be much different because we took right. out the fee of the surgeon into this. So the fee of the personnel that was really cost and not charge. Uh, that's also more difficult to define because in some country charge is much more than the cost. Uh, and that we not so uh, I think it would be that's a, I think it's an area that deserve investigation and in different countries different procedures and I'm also convinced that top journal like JAMA surgery annals of surgery would be very interested to have conclusive data on this. Uh, so I move to the next subject which is new technology and modern technology such as robotics and laparoscopic surgery and here we have an incremental increase in cost which is much more in countries such as India, where the overall cost of surgery is low and the hospital bed is cheap. So a one day or two day discharge does not amount to a big difference in billing. Um, I just spend a little time on this question. I go back to a very old paper, which you remember from the early days of laparoscopic cholecystectomy, A.W. Majid from Sheffield. They did a randomized control trial when laparoscopic cholecystectomy was just coming in. They made very scathing remarks that the industry has pushed laparoscopic cholecystectomy to the extent that it is very difficult to actually convince the patient that an alternative is better. So when you look into that as a background, how do you fit new technology into cost effectiveness, into benchmarking and into complications and show that you're actually getting a better outcome with these technologies or bigger bang for the buck. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I don't know how qualified I, I am to answer all these questions because this is, a, of course, a hot topic. I was recently in Argentina when they told me if a patient wants robotic surgery, they have to pay $10,000 out of pocket immediately. Yes. Otherwise, they would not do it, right? So maybe from an ethic perspective, it's difficult to ask that because everybody knows a cholecystectomy doesn't need the robot to be successful, right? In some way, yeah. not with really better. So the data is missing. Uh, data is coming now a little bit. We, there is one at least benchmark on distal pancreatectomy. I, I think it's a bit too early on Whipple, et cetera. So that's an evolving procedures. It's expensive. And we see even in my country now, they are less enthusiastic about uh, robotic surgery because we are pay or the hospital is paid with the DRG. So we have an amount of money, 100,000, even if it's high, and then you have to take out everything that costs. So what the hospital does, if you have a tool that you don't need, they will tell you, yeah, do laparoscopy or even do it open for different procedures. So that's a, a socioeconomic discussion. That is every country need to conduct that. We need to get down the price of all this technology, that's clear. And uh, of course, they will do as expensive as they can. If they are forced, they will do lower. I mean, we have only one robot now. Soon there would be more, probably the price will decrease. And this is not new. There's been stapler initially. There's many new technology that come or they are disruptive because the surgeon will like it. Sometimes the result is better, at least it's faster. Uh, I would imagine today if we uh, don't have a ligature or harmonic scalpel uh, as we did before, uh, that certainly <laughs> make a big difference in the surgery we are doing. I think all that are open question. And I hope that some of the tool, whether it's benchmark, whether it's the, the classification or not, will help. But the, the, the subject is also complex, is how do you define benefit at the level of the society? Uh, and who is paying? Because that's the way it is. And who, who, who do they want to pay more? Should the patient in my country would not be possible to ask patient to pay? They have a coverage. So how do we do? So then at the end, a hospital may, may come, and that's coming now because we have economic issue also in this country, to come to me and say, you know, we are not, you are not allowed to do uh, robotic uh, distal pancreatic. Probably they will, because that thing is caused. But let's say cholecystectomy. And then it goes to training, because we need our resident to train the robot on cholecystectomy. So there are many issues that, that are complex that I don't think we can just uh, answer in an executive way, but they, they are key questions 
uh, at this time because we are facing a dramatic increase in technology and those who were here the last 20 years, uh, this is just increasing and increasing every five years, uh, costly and same thing in oncology. I mean, we have the same issue in drug medication. You know, how much can we spend to save a life? Even if you save, can you spend half a million dollars even if you know patient will die in one month, you give the drug and he will survive. Now, very difficult question and uh, ethic question. So interesting question, but I think it need, as you say, two or three days discussion and many people speaking. Uh, which would lead to my next question that today, a uh, lot of treatment, unlike the old days where you had a tumor, you cut it out. Today, treatment is much more multifactorial and much more complex. For example, in perihilar cholangiocarcinoma, when you talk about liver transplant, you're not just talking about the operation of transplant. You're talking about an exploratory laparotomy or laparoscopy. You're talking about chemo radiation. You're talking about dropouts on a waiting list. You're talking about then a liver transplant in an irradiated field, its subsequent complications, and a one-year follow-up. While for surgery, you're talking about a complex liver resection and a three-month follow-up. So are we actually evaluating complete processes or are we still on evaluating simple surgeries? I would like your comment on that. Well, that I can be short because uh, you have to compare the comprehensive treatment. So if you look at uh, perihilar cholangio, if you use myo protocol or something like that need to be included. In addition, you have the dropout. That's more difficult. That is a bias because you need to start uh, all the patient at the same point. Otherwise, you may advise someone for liver transplant, but most of them have dropped out and they don't have the procedure. So that's not a good proposition at the beginning. Although if you just look at the outcome, it looks like. I think we are uh, educated as surgeon and we need to take that into account and inform the patient properly. But clearly you need to take into account all, all factors included in that. From the time uh, so my, uh, of the uh, diagnosis, until you look at your outcome. That's absolutely key. So my apologies to you, but when you presented your paper, 1.5% mortality versus 13% mortality, did it include all these steps or did yes. it just include the surgery? No, it included all, but we had a hard time with the reviewers because of the dropout, right? So they were right. telling us you have, and, and there's a study that was done in France that I, that I asked, the, that was presented the European Surgical. There is a discussion at the end because they have to stop. They did a randomized trial on liver yes. transplant versus resection, and they have to stop to do this because of the dropout. And that's also local problem because of access to radiation. So there are many factors. And I fully agree with you. You cannot just come and say, well, uh, do a transplant and you have no mortality. Uh, that needs to be corrected for, for, the, for the beginning. Absolutely. That's very, very important. Uh so I think uh, we've had a long and extensive discussion. Uh, Professor Klebin, what are your thoughts for future developments in this field? What are now your current interests in, in outcome management? And what are you going to publish in the next five years that we should look forward to? Well, thank you for, the, for these questions. I mean, usually, you know, as, yeah, an idea may come during the night and you start the next day. So I don't know what would be the next dream or where we go. Well, I think what's important uh, is that it's also validated or not validated by others. I think it's very important that we put on the market, if I might say that stuff that are validated, that brings something. Because if we come with like, so the, the benchmarks still need, in my opinion, we I believe it, that's not enough need to be tested and that's done by a few other centers or so several publications has nothing to do with us. We've used that need to, to see is that accepted? Does that make sense? Is that useful? That's that I think something I look, so not what I'm just doing, but what the other, the other are doing for this. And the CCI, I mean, now we will have to revisit that at some point. It would be also good that may be done in another country because the patient population was done here. Is that the same in India? Is that the same in South Africa and Argentina? I don't know, a few studies have been done and seems to go in that direction. We have one now that's done in the pediatric population, for example, it's different in the pediatric maybe that it is. So that tool that we have still need to be under evaluation all the time, I think that's important. And I think you cover that for me is the economic aspect. Now we have more and more, despite we have more tool and we expect something else, but the world is becoming crazy. In Switzerland, we have deficit, sorry, in the hospital and stuff like that. So. 
I think we need to look at that also from the society perspective and, and cost and have our own tool. We are, I don't know if it is in India, but we are dominated, I repeat, my manager that want to charge everything they can on us. The administration has increased by 30% in, in my hospital and the number of doctors have decreased by 15%. And then they come with figures and charge us. I think we're in the same boat as clinician and our focus is patients and the focus of hospital sometimes, although they say patient is more on the economy and look good and et cetera, et cetera. And we need a tool. And I would love if other will really try to correlate with a CCI that we have really a tool against or not against, but to, to just compare to what the administration want to see. I think this is what is coming ahead of us, at least in Western countries, but I would suspect this is the same in any countries in the world. And uh, Professor Senadapan has got an international audience for you. The people from all over Asia, Africa, South America, listening to these talks, and I'm sure that he will coordinate with you in future, and there'll be a lot of enthusiastic surgeons who will be very happy to link in, provide data of good quality metrics to really look forward to these collaborations. And that was an absolutely spectacular talk, and thank you very much for an honest discussion. If there are any pressing audience questions, or Professor Senadipan, if you have any questions, I'm sure we could take them now. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sudeep. Uh... That was a wonderful talk and a wonderful moderation. Actually, the speaker was congratulating every time when you ask a question. Actually, we uh, no wonder we call you a uh, devil's advocate, uh, Dr. Sudeep. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you once again, uh, uh, Professor Alan Clavian. And uh, if anybody has a question, uh, uh, Professor Alan Clavian will be happy to answer. Please raise your hand if any. We will be waiting for two minutes. Uh, uh, actually, there was a problem with the uh, Zoom today. Actually, I was uh, trying to sort it out. Uh, our uh, Zoom capacity was uh, more than 500. Actually, they were not letting in more than 300 uh, today. So the capacity came down to 300. That's why we couldn't go above 300 today. So I was sorting it out uh, uh, while the discussion was going on. So I couldn't um, really uh, uh, engage into the uh, the program. So uh, I, I think uh, many of the audience uh, uh, have questions. If you have any questions, you can write to me at senadipan at uh, gmail.com. We'll be conveying the questions to uh, Sir, uh, Alan Clavian, and uh, uh, we'll be uh, discussing again. Dr. Rajesh has raised his hand. Uh, Dr. Rajesh. Can you please unmute yourself? Dr. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, Baiju, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can. Yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Baiju, uh, Baiju is my good friend and we discuss. I'm a consultant colorectal and pediatric surgeon from uh, United Kingdom NHS in a University of Hospitals of Plymouth. Um, we follow Clavian Dindo classification for our audit purpose in the mortality morbidity meeting. And uh, we use it as a tool to see which are all the patients went back to surgery, which are the patients who had a, a interventional procedure or some sort of complications. We don't go into grade one or two, we, uh, grade three and above we go. And the colorectal surgery, surgical site infections are absolutely more one in 10 percentage gets SSI and complications, okay? By forming a, a tool or bundle to treat these patients, I reduced my complication rate to seven percentage, which we have an audit, the microbiology audit, it's automatic and they select my patients, look into my complications and give a report every month. So it is a very good tool to see uh, uh, an audit department looking at it in a different perspective, unbiased, and we get all the patients recorded and we get the complications. So when I came to India, I was uh, took sabbatical and I also worked in gym hospital Chennai. And uh, I looked into my complications. Again, SSIs, it reduced to 3%. So 7% in UK reduced to 3% in India. So absolutely there is no comparison uh, or any uh, decline of uh, results in India also. So we can give the same quality same uh, uh, level of treatment in both United Kingdom 
and as well as india so i disagree with uh, underdeveloped countries or anything we have all the procedures all the uh, equipments to control the infection and uh, the, the 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 main uh, main problem is uh, uh, the surgeon human factors the human factors plays a big role okay i am a big surgeon i do like this and uh, my results are there if you audit everyone's results we can identify what is the problem okay so because i am in colorectal i just want to ask you a question it's a, there is no worldwide common theme that whether the bowel preparation and oral antibiotics is needed to reduce the exercise it goes in circle every time 5 to 10 years they the circle comes there is no need for bowel preparation and again a study comes with the antibiotics and bowel preparation okay so if if you can uh, answer this question i know that uh, it might be a difficult to answer what will be the future whether in the colorectal surgery whether the bowel preparation with oral antibiotics is a necessary or uh, you take into consider the economy and uh, just follow whatever your department uh, uh, plans this is one question and uh, the future research will be on human factors and i am happy both i am working in gem hospital chennai and the united kingdom i can be a part of a study which i can involve in you and see how can we improve on much human factors in surgical site infection over to you byju yeah um, professor alan uh, pavin uh, well i mean uh, uh, well thank you for these uh, for these comments i think if you the question that you have antibiotics etc you just need a level 1 evidence everything else will probably be a problem into this so you need a randomized control trial i'm not a colorectal surgeon i think we don't do prep of a bowel we don't we do not anymore it's supposed to arm i have not read all this literature i don't know whether this is a, i thought it was level 1 evidence maybe it's not but i think here we have to i don't think rct is necessary for many questions that we can answer in a different way but i have the impression here that uh, you probably need that you can always do some uh, meta analysis i don't know that maybe also but uh, that's just my answer to this and the other one the human factor is certainly a hot topic i don't have a definitive answer but it's certainly a hot topic to try to uh, balance in our uh, uh, outcome thank you professor thank, thank you, you dr rajesh uh, dr manjusha from pune she is the head of the department of surgery uh, in pune medical college dr manjusha please uh good evening sir uh, actually my question is uh, i just wanted to know the name of the site which calculates that matrix because my phd topic was on surgical outcome in metabolic syndrome disease patient so i am going to consider clavin dindo classification for complication uh, in the post operative period so, uh, so dr sudeep sir just mentioned about one site which calculates that matrix so is it possible to tell it again or uh, put it in the chat box so that that will be helpful for uh, me i have already put it there it's accesssurgery.com and it, i put it in the chat okay thank you sir thank you so much thank you dr manjusha and if anybody has any question you can raise your hand and ask questions or otherwise we will wind up thank you professor alan clavian for uh, accepting my invitation to uh, present this valuable topic in senadbin education foundation and you presented it uh, so crisp and clear uh, and uh, thank you dr sudeep shah again uh, our star uh, from india uh, for moderating the session and thank you dr abdullahi for introducing the speaker and moderator and thank you all uh, who have logged in from different parts of the world i think more than uh, 60 70 countries uh, have logged into this uh, meeting thank you all for logging in over to dr Mod uh, dr sadisha and uh, dr uh, alan pavian well from my side thank you very much dr abdalla dr uh, sudeep shah it was a very 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 thoughtful very excellent discussion and thank you uh, dr senadipan for the invitation i think it was a great pleasure for me thank you so much for doing this and uh, thank you once again uh, i think dr senadipan gets the best possible speakers for the best possible subjects i've enjoyed watching your youtube channels and i think uh, for all the audience and for all the residents it is compulsory viewing because these are gems from the great authorities of the world a lot of food for thought 
and please continue the good work and, and i will always be your fan thank you very much thank you thank you so much okay thank you very much thank you bye bye